Hello everyone, here we'll be talking about momentum, impulse, and collisions. Now first I want to get the ball rolling by defining momentum and impulse, and then we'll look at these uh, two theorems. Well, one's a theorem, the other one's a uh, conservation of, it's a principle basically. But they're kind of the same, they're both really theorems. Uh, but the, they both are consequences of these definitions. So here we see momentum, and we use lowercase p uh, to denote momentum. Is a vector quantity is equal to mass times velocity. Impulse as a vector quantity is defined to be force times the change in time. Now intuitively what momentum means is basically once something has started rolling or moving, then it kind of keeps moving in its own way. And that's kind of hard to understand, but the best way I can think of describing it is in a situation where you're walking or running down a hill and it's hard to stop. You kind of have to keep moving, so to speak, in order to actually stop. You can't just stop right on the dot like you would walking on a flat surface. Similarly, a ball, once a ball is set in motion, it keeps moving in its own right and kind of develops its momentum until it stops. So that's an intuitive way of understanding it. But notice that both of those ideas of momentum have to do with the object's velocity at that given instance and the mass of the object as well, or a person in the case of walking, down, walking or running down a hill. Great. But in physics, we just define it to be mass times velocity, kind of simply. Now, as far as the unit goes, well, there's no special unit, so it's just kind of the culmination of these units. So here the unit for mass, of course, is kilograms, and then for uh, velocity, it's going to be meters per second. And in fact, notice that if you multiply it and divide it by seconds, then you get kilograms, meters per second squared times second. And kilograms times meters per second squared, if you don't recall, is newtons. So you can actually call this newton seconds. So newtons times second. So that's one way you can, um, you can, I guess, categorize a unit, but for whatever reason, this is kind of used more often. And then notice these are vector quantities. So if you wanted to split it up into components, you would get px is equal to mvx and py is equal to mvy. I'm not going to write that, but you can show that on your own. Okay. Um, now, impulse I haven't quite described, and I'm not actually going to because once we get here, it will get a really good idea as far as how we can think of impulse. Now, there is something I kind of want to say before we get there, though. Notice that if we were to divide um, both of these by delta t, well, I guess we would need a delta, but let me kind of explain. So if we divide velocity by t, that reminds us of acceleration, because acceleration is velocity divided by time. Not quite, though. Acceleration, if you don't recall, is change in velocity over change in time. So we need a, a delta here. But that's okay, because if we consider, of course, delta is final minus initial, if we consider change in momentum, it's going to be pf minus pi, it's going to be mvf minus mvi, factor out the m, that's just m times delta p. So in other words, delta p is equal to m delta v, and then of course if you divide both sides by t like this, by delta t that is, then notice that delta v over delta t is just a as a vector. And this is great because, well, this is just ma, which is force. So really we get this, we get that um, the change in momentum over change in time is equal to force. So one can say that force is actually, well, the force is actually um, the rate of change in momentum, which is kind of an okay way of seeing it. Now what you'll notice is that if you multiply both sides by delta t, you indeed get this side, and in fact, really what we get is this following theorem here, that impulse is really just change in momentum. Which makes sense because if you multiply both sides by delta t in this equation, then you get f delta t is equal to a change in momentum, which is exactly what impulse is. So just to expand this out a little bit, this is mvf as a vector, of course, minus mvi. Good. So this actually tells us what impulse is. Impulse really is just change in momentum. So every instantaneous change in momentum, or I guess the average change in momentum if you want, is what impulse is defined to be. Um, in fact, very often when you hear the word impulse, to me what kind of comes to mind is like a, a rocket with like thrusters and there's like a, an impulse of thrust. I don't know if that's quite a right way of seeing it. Maybe I'm getting some terminology mixed up. But I think that works because if you kind of treat that thrust as an impulse, what it's doing is kind of changing momentum each time. 
But maybe I'm going a little, little off the rails there, but something to think about. Okay, now notice since uh, I is uh, impulse is change in momentum, their units will actually be the same. So they're both measured in kilogram centimeter per second. Now for uh, conservation of momentum, we need to consider Newton's uh, third law of motion. Now remember Newton's second law is F equals M8. Uh, you don't need to really remember the order of the laws. I don't think that's as important as actually knowing what they are. So namely, if you uh, apply a force in one direction, you get the same force happening in the opposite direction, which is kind of hard to visualize, but imagine you have a wall and you hit a hammer against the wall. The amount of force you apply, you'll feel back. So the, the force is applied kind of in both directions, kind of. So you apply a force in one direction, but once you hit, then it's applied in the opposite direction. And the same is true if you hit anything, really, with the hammer. Um, okay. So really... So we're going to recall Newton's second law, which again says force from object 1 to 2 is equal to negative force from 2 to 1. So the force is felt back the exact same in the opposite direction. So if you apply a force from object 1 to object 2, then that's equal to negative the force from object 2 to object 1. So it's almost like the wall would hit us back with the same force. Okay. So now... Uh, how can we use this to our advantage? Well, if we multiply both sides by delta t, what we end up getting is basically uh, this right here. We get impulse. We get impulse of this is equal to negative impulse of that. So you can write it like that, I guess. The impulse of 1, 2 is equal to negative impulse of 2, 1, which sounds kind of funny to me, but let's see if we can write it. Now, remember that impulse is the change in momentum. Now, what from 1 to 2 and from what 2 to 1 mean, it's kind of hard to describe that. I guess you can kind of think of these two objects like this kind of colliding. So this one had, like let's say, mass 1, and this one had mass 2. This had velocity v1, and this had velocity v2. Then 1 to 2, and then 2 to 1, notice they just have the same but opposite uh, forces. So that, that's, that's I, I think, the explanation of this. But as far as the labeling goes, kind of where I'm at, we can just call this labeling just literally uh, M, M1 times V1. But remember, impulse is change in momentum. So I'm actually going to call this the change in momentum of P1 equals change in momentum of P2. But we have these two objects that are kind of uh, crashing together, basically. We have a collision, kind of. Now, if you expand this out, you get what? You get P1... Well, I guess we can expand it out using this. So maybe that's okay. So we'll get M, M1, uh, V1F, like that, minus M1, V1, I, equals M2, V2F, so that looks good, minus M2, V2, I. That's V2F. So very similar to what we had for conservation of mechanical energy, notice since all of the initials are negative, if we add them to the other side, um, we'll have the same sign. But the finals, well actually, you know what? Something I'm not doing here, so this is where I kind of messed up a little bit. So this negative, there we go. This negative changes things actually. In fact, really what it does is if you distribute this negative here, it changes both of these signs. So really, this is negative, that's positive. There we go, that makes more sense. So now if we, um, let's say, uh, let's say add this to that side and add this to that side, we get the sum of the initials is equal to the sum of the finals. So that'll be the final conservation momentum formula, and I'll write that down below. So it's going to be M1V1F plus M2V2F, equals M1V1I plus M1, no, I'm sorry, M2V2I, there we go. So the sum of the finals is equal to the sum of the initials for momentum. Awesome, so that's basically what the conservation of momentum says. And now we can move on and see some examples, and then we'll see a new idea in collisions, which is kind of basically a modification of this formula. 
All right, so for this example, we we're given a uh, car crash test, and I've given a, a diagram here, some type of visualization to help us picture what's going on. So, but without the picture, let's see if we can figure out and compare. So it says in a crash test, a 1500 kilogram car collides into a wall with rebound. The initial velocity of the car is 15 meters per second, and the final velocity from the rebound is 2.6 meters per second. The collision lasts 0.15 seconds, we want to find A, impulse, and B, magnitude and direction of average force due to the uh, collisions, of course. Well, impulse due to collision, force due to collision is what I meant to say. Now, uh, here you'll notice that we have some signage going on with the, um, with the velocities. I'll talk about that. Now, notice that the initial velocity is 15 meters per second, but that is, well, it's headed towards the, the wall. So the direction of this velocity is implied to be negative, and the reason being is because if we're going towards the wall, notice the distance between us, delta x, is decreasing. So if delta x is getting smaller and smaller, that means the velocity is actually, is actually negative in that case. So remember that if you have positive velocity, then your, your, um, your change in, in uh, displacement is increasing, not decreasing. So that means we're going in the opposite direction. So actually this implies that um, the i is negative 15 meters per second, Hence the, the sign there. Similarly, the final velocity from the rebound, so it's after crashing, is going to be in the opposite direction because it's due to the rebound, so it's bouncing back, basically, with positive 2.6. So VF in this case is 2.6 meters per second. And we're golden. We are honestly great because impulse, we know, is what? Impulse is just change in momentum. Change in momentum is of course MVF minus MVI. If you consider pulling out M, this is just M, well, MVF minus MVI. In other words, M times delta V. Now M of course is given to be 15 kilograms. Everything's in the correct standard unit, so we're okay. And I notice this is gonna be VF is 2.6 minus VI is actually negative 15, so there's a double negative there. And in fact, notice that if you add these, you get 17.6. So in total, the impulse will be 1,500 multiplied by 17.6, and my calculator gave me exactly 26,400, and the unit for impulse is the same as unit of momentum, which is kilograms times meters per second. If you want to use Newton seconds, I think that's better, but for whatever reason, this is more standard. But they're the same. That's fine. Now... We want to find the magnitude and direction of the average force. So let's see, what is the average force? Well, I actually haven't spoken about average force when uh, we did the previous calculation when we manipulated the formula for impulse, not impulse, but you know, formula for momentum. But let me just say, remember that we had delta P is equal to M delta V. By considering the, well, the, the change in momentum is just the change in MVs. And since M is the same, you can pull it out and you get M times change in uh, velocity. And we recall that if we divide both sides by delta T, this right here, delta V over delta T, is the acceleration. In reality, technically, it's the average acceleration. So this really is M A bar, I guess. So notice this is really F. And you can, we can call it F av for average. And uh, notice that if you consider these as vectors, uh, here we want magnitude and direction, so we're definitely going to consider it as a vector. So that's why I'm not writing the bar notation here, but that's okay. So it's really the change in momentum, which by the way is just the impulse, divided by the change in time. Perfect. And we already have impulse. In fact, notice in reality here, uh, this is as a vector. I think that makes sense because all of these quantities aren't actually magnitudes. Notice a uh, VI is negative 15. The magnitude of VI would be positive 15 because magnitudes are always positive. Now, um, because it's just a value, of course. So the sign represents the, the um, direction when it comes to a linear motion problem. And this, of course, is linear motion. So what that tells me is that all we really need to do is divide impulse by uh, time. Change in time is given here. It's 0.15 seconds. I'm going to see a different color red, but that's okay. 
So that means this is going to be nothing but impulse, which is 26400 divided by 0.15. And that's, of course, going to be, notice here, if you divide by seconds, you get newtons indeed. So that'll be in, sec in uh, newtons. Now, of course, impulse here as a vector is positive, so the impulse is in the positive direction, not the negative direction. Otherwise, the resulting uh, signs would be negative. So the magnitude here is included in our calculation. So the sign here tells us that it's going to be in the positive direction. And just to emphasize that, when I evaluate this, I'm going to write plus. And there's going to be that in newtons. And of course, now it's calculator time. And my calculator gave me 176,000 newtons. So let me kind of leave a little more space for that. 176,000, and that's in newtons. Awesome. And that completes this example. Now we'll move on to one more, where we'll actually start to see um, some, some type of uh, conservation of momentum. Because notice we didn't have any of that here. And we actually used the uh, impulse momentum theorem because the impulse is changing momentum. But that's kind of simple. But now in the next problem, we'll actually see the uh, conservation momentum in play. All right, so for this example, we have an archer weighing um, 60 kilograms of mass at rest on ice. We're assuming the ice is frictionless. Kind of a bizarre situation, but anyways, let's continue. He fires a 0.3 kilogram arrow at a velocity of 50 meters per second and slides back as a consequence. So once he fires, as a consequence of shooting that, he slides back, basically because of Newton's uh, third law. Okay, uh, now we want to find his velocity if he fires with, uh, he fires the arrow horizontally, so just kind of straight like the image shows, and then B if he fires at an angle of 30 degrees above the horizontal. So in this, the second example, he's actually shooting the arrow up like this with an angle of 30 degrees. But in both cases, he still slides back. Uh, he's probably gonna slide back a little slower the second time because since he's pointing it up, there's less horizontal motion or the horizontal component of uh, the arrow, or the arrow's velocity is less in that case. But in any, in, any, in any event for both of these, we'll actually be taking advantage of the conservation of momentum theorem that we saw. Now remember that the version we saw the last one we ended on was that the initial, the sum of the initial um, momentums of the two objects is equal to the sum of the final momentums of the two objects. Now here, of course, the two objects are the archer and the arrow. Now the interesting he thing here is that, um, although I don't really say in detail, this 60 kilograms actually is the archer including the arrow. So the archers, it, it's kind of strange, but you have like these two different things happening because there's, there's a scenario when, when he starts and he's actually 60, but then when he releases, he's no longer 60 kilograms. Now he is uh, 60 minus 0 0.03 kilograms. But in any event, I think we're okay. Yeah, well, what I'm actually going to do is I'm, I'm going to, uh, to subtract that because since we're considering the velocity after he releases, then we're going to use his mass to be 60 minus 0 0.03, which by the way is 59.97. So again, just to remind us what the conservation of momentum uh, theorem we saw earlier says, basically it says the sum of the initial momentums is equal to the sum of the final momentums. So I'm going to write that here actually. We'll write the sum of pi is equal to the sum of pf, to write it kind of less formally. And in this case, if we're considering only the horizontal motion here, we're going to attach a subscript of x in this case. Now, the reason why I want to write it like this is because we can kind of see things a little quicker. Now, notice just to label things correctly, um, let's label, I think we're okay in labeling maybe over here. So let's call the archer our first object. So his mass M1 after releasing the arrow would be 59.97. That's in kilograms. His velocity after releasing the arrow is unknown for both of these problems. 
Now, the velocity, the mass of the arrow we know, the mass of the arrow is going to be, says M2, is 0 0.03 kilograms. The velocity of the arrow actually kind of depends, because remember here, we're considering the x components only. So really, I should say M, uh, V1x and V2x, but since in this case it's horizontal, we don't really need the subscripts because it's all one-dimensional anyways. But here, since it's two-dimensional because we have an angle now, V2x, the uh, horizontal velocity of the arrow actually changes. But uh, for problem A, let me just say that the velocity is just straight up 50 meters per second. Okay. So with that being said, let's see if we can figure some things out. Now, in particular, we actually have final and initials that are kind of kind of different here. So the initial, vol the initial velocity of the arrow is actually zero. So V2i is actually zero. Similarly, the archer's velocity, V1i, is also zero because he's standing at rest and he hasn't fired the arrow yet. So in fact, what this really tells us is that the uh, initials, the sum of the initial momentums is equal to zero as well. And this makes sense because momentum is velocity times mass. Since the initial velocities are, bo are both zero, then the initial uh, momentums are both zero, so the sum of those are also zero. So really what we end up getting is that this is equal to the sum of the final momentums, and the final momentums are basically, well, these final velocities times these masses. And in fact, what we can kind of do here, I think, is just write it, just write it out without plugging the numbers first. So it's going to be m1v1f plus m2v2f. Now again, v2f is 50, and uh, m1 and m2 are given. So really we can multiply these, but we want to find vf. So I'm going to solve for v1f first. This is the one we're trying to find. So I'll solve for this in terms of the others, and we'll see if we can continue. I'm going to subtract this to the other side, and then divide by m1. So really what we end up getting is that v1f, It's a 1. So V1F is equal to, subtracting that, we get negative M2 V2F divided by M1 because we want to divide by M1 after subtracting this over. Notice zeros on the other side, so we get this. And plugging numbers in, we get 0 0.03 times 50. Sorry for the small writing, but I think I just want to make it all fit, obviously. And then divided by 59. Point uh, 97. Nice. So now we'll use our calculator to approximate this, and notice it's of course going to be in meters per second. So let's see what we get. So I got about 0 0.025 meters per second, and notice it's going to be negative because we got this negative here, so I really should have wrote negative. So it's negative 0 0.025, and that's meters per second. Okay, so let me box that. And now I suggested earlier that the fact that moving at an angle uh, 30 degrees and releasing at the same final velocity of the arrow, the horizontal velocity will be less because it's going to be basically multiplied by cosine of 30. And I think that will, will actually result in a slower velocity um, to the archer moving in the opposite direction. But let's find out. And notice it's going to be exactly the same. The initials are exactly the same. The only difference is that the um, this guy here, V2F, the uh, arrow velocity is actually different in this case for v. And in fact, what it is, is actually not too difficult to compute. Here, v2f is equal to, well, really this is the horizontal component. So this is v2f, the magnitude of the arrow alone, multiplied by cosine of the angle. Now, the um, velocity of the arrow is 50 times cosine of the angle, which is 30. And we can compute this using our calculator. So I'll do that right now. And I get about 43.3 meters per second. And I notice that the, uh, the resulting formula will be exactly the same. So let me just write, as a consequence of this, we get V1F is equal to negative M2 V2F, but now V2F X specifically. Again, these are all horizontal in reality. The only thing that's not horizontal now is the arrow's magnitude. The, the velocity that is. So for that reason, we can calculate again the horizontal magnitude of velocity which, of the arrow, which we have. 
So that really only needs to subscript everything else that's in relief. And then again, divide by M1. And the masses are still the same because again, after releasing, he loses that mass of the arrow. And now plugging things in, we get 0 0.03 times not 50 anymore, but now times 43.3 and then divide by 59.97. So notice really all we're doing, if you think about it, is just multiplying this answer by cosine of 30. And since cosine of 30 is, a, is radical 3 over 2, which is 0.866, it's definitely going to be multiplying by a number less than 1. So that'll uh, consequently give us a number that's smaller. It's a little strange, though. Um, actually, it's not strange. Let's just take a look at what the value is. Let's use my calculator. I got negative 0 0.022 meters per second, which is certainly slower, likely, if Vito would be. Now, I'm going to be quite, uh, quite honest here. The problem I'm pulling this from from the book is worded slightly different and I didn't quite do it justice, but let me just kind of explain just so we have a kind of understanding what their version says. Now in their version, these are actually two separate arrows, not two different scenarios. So they're kind of all in the same, um, I guess, timeline you could think of it as. So his first arrow, he shoots horizontally and slides back. Then he pulls a second arrow out and then shoots at that angle. Now that changes things a little bit because of course it changes his mass to, well, the second time around, he loses another arrow of 0 0.03 kilograms. So his new mass would be uh, 59.94. But in addition to that, he would actually be, well, he would be sliding back still. So now his initial velocity wouldn't be zero. His initial velocity would be the final velocity that we got from part A. And in fact, really all that entails, and I hope you agree with me, is just changing this to uh, 9.4, 59.94, which is losing another 0 0.03 from the arrow, and adding this to this velocity we already had. Because if he's sliding back already, then he's going at this constant velocity now because it's frictionless ice he's standing on. And then with the other arrow shot at 30 degrees above the horizontal, he'll now increase his velocity by this. Not quite this though, because we have to uh, change that. So I'm just kind of doing that in my calculator here. So if we do um, change the denominator here to point to 59.94, this ends up being about the same actually. But then if you add these together, you get about point, I don't know, point zero four seven or four six seven. And if you want to read through that example in the book, it's actually on page one sixty eight, and they actually even do a third part, which I think is a little too beyond our discussion. But it's kind of interesting, you can take a look at it, of course, it has to do with finding the normal force, the average normal force of the arrow in the second shot scenario. But anyways, that's all I want to say as far as momentum and impulse go, and now we'll talk about collisions finally. Right, so now finally we enter collisions, and there is quite a lot to say. There actually turns out to be three different types of collisions. I don't really have to describe to you what collision means. I, I think we have the understanding. Basically, it's when two objects collide. So we first recall the conservation of momentum, which we've been using already for a bit, so that's okay. And then we have these three scenarios, three types of collisions, basically. There is inelastic, elastic, and glancing. Now, inelastic means that they don't bounce. There's no bouncing of or rebounding of both of the objects. So basically, when they collide, one may be stronger than the other, and they both, as a consequence, go in one direction. We'll actually see an example of that uh, shortly after this, where we'll see two cars co uh, crash, and one's actually going faster than the other and is stronger, so it ends up pushing both of them back a bit. Elastic, though, is where you have these two objects that after colliding, they bounce back. So think of, let's say, uh, in the game of uh, pool or billiards, when two balls collide, they, they may bounce back. And of course, that kind of depends, because sometimes you have this kind of... Uh, hitting where one goes and it keeps going forward, for instance. Uh, we're not really going to be considering that, but that, that is technically an, uh, an elastic collision. But for the most part, it's, it's bouncing back like that. In fact, I think maybe that only happens. But in any event, some people do weird things when it comes to pool. Um, now, glancing also you can consider kind of in, um, in billiards. Basically, glancing is where they don't hit each other head on where one hits another just barely, it kind of grazes it. Well, maybe not barely, but it's what is called at a glance. So 
the axis of one of the balls of its uh, trajectory doesn't hit the other uh, object head on. So as a consequence, what you end up getting is that they actually split. So instead of going back, this one still goes forward like this, but here the other ball is now going in the other direction like that. So now we have this, well, these are both, of course, one dimension motion problems. Now this becomes a two dimension motion problem. So we have these two angles here, theta and phi. And I'm gonna talk about all of these three types, but I mainly wanna focus on inelastic. We're only gonna see an example on that one at least I provide formulas here, so if you want to tackle the other ones, you certainly can do so. Now, for inelastic, we're going to consider the following. Since they both end up um, kind of as one unit in the end, they both will actually have the same final velocity, which is nice, simplifies things quite a bit. So here I'm going to say V2F and V1F are both equal to the same uh, velocity, final velocity. Let's just call it VF. So in that case, notice here, if V1F and V2F are the same, you can actually factor it out, so you end up getting that m1 plus m2 all times the quantity vf is equal to all this. m1 v1i uh, plus m2 v2i, just like that. And now finally, dividing by this quantity to sum of the masses, we end up getting the final velocity is equal to m1 v1i plus m2 v2i all divided by the sum of the masses, m1 plus m2. And this is our equation that we'll be using for elastic collision, inelastic collision problems. Now, elastic collision, I don't want to talk about the derivation too much of the formula, but let me just say that we're going to consider the combination, basically, of um, conservation of momentum and the work energy theorem, or I guess it was... Um, Conservation of mechanical energy, technically, is what this is. Now, I didn't have a space to write it all. I kind of, I guess I do have space to write it all. But instead, this is a more compact form of writing it. So remember the, that the conservation of mechanical energy basically says that the non-conservative force is equal to the um, initials minus the finals for kinetic energies. But if you consider the non-conservative forces to be zero, and actually uh, add the finals to the other side or vice versa, you end up getting that the initials are equal to the finals for kinetic energy. But then if you just subtract in the right way, you end up getting that the kinetic energy, so final minus initial of one of the objects is equal to final minus initial of the other uh, object's kinetic energy. In other words, you get this. But anyways, um, if you expand that out, and you'll notice that you'll get m1 v1 uh, squared minus m1 v2 squared, but final minus initial. Now, what you'll have is a difference of squares. You'll have final squared minus initial squared. You can expand that out as a difference of squares as mf, uh, not mf, but vf minus vi times vf plus vi for each of the ones and twos. And basically, you can cancel a few things and you end up getting this. So the masses end up, end up canceling because of the conservation of uh, momentum, as it turns out. It's kind of strange, but um, I just didn't have space to write it out. And in fact, I would love to show you, but it just takes a little bit of uh, finessing that I just don't want to spend too much time in this video because I'd rather just show you how to apply the formulas. But if you want to take a look at it, it's in the book um, on page... Yeah, I believe it's on page 173 is where they go through actually deriving this. They use differences squares. They use this combined with that. It's not a hard read at all. I basically just described it to you in a nutshell. Now, glancing basically just straight up comes from this. But um, glancing collision assumes in this case that one of the objects is moving, the other one is not. So for that reason, if you look at this, and if you call this first object one and this first, the second object two, like we kind of have I described here in these uh, diagrams, then in this case, glancing, in the glancing scenario, the uh, second object is actually not moving initially. So the V2i is zero, so that second one goes to zero. Now, since we're looking at x components here, we're going to multiply the final velocities by cosine of their angles, assuming we know the angles theta and phi. And there is a way to find the angles, but it's just using this anyways. 
So you can use this type of, uh, well, these equations in those types of problems to find the angles, but you have to know the final velocities after the collision. That's the only catch. Okay. So now, uh, here, similarly for y components, notice, initially, everything's all horizontal and linear, but then after this glancing collision, now we have a two-dimensional motion problem. So to begin with, well, there was no y component for object 1 or object 2, because object 2 was resting anyways. So the initial velocity for object 2 is always 0 for any of these, but for the y component, well, the y component of 1 is 0 initially. So these are both 0. And then for the final velocities, we just multiply those final velocity magnitudes by sine of those angles because it's the y component. Great. So it may take a little, little bit of time explaining these collisions, but at least we have these formulas. So this, I guess, are the uh, com bind formulas for the components of glancing, and uh, there's elastic also. Well, you can, again, do problems on those if you like using these formulas, but we're just going to do an example involving inelastic collision, so let's take a look at that example right now. All right, so for this example, we have these two cars that are colliding head-on. We have an 1,800 kilogram pickup truck and a 900 kilogram compact car. Uh, they're both headed in opposite directions, one's going eastbound, the other one's going westbound, and they're actually going at the same speed. So they're both traveling at 15 meters per second, and after colliding, the cars become entangled, and we want to find their speed after collision, and then a change of velocity of each vehicle, which I think will be kind of, kind of easy to do. And C, I think, will take a little bit of time. Um, actually, it'll take a little bit of space, really, so I don't know if we have enough space here for C. I may need to erase things after, but we'll, uh, we'll see. So it says change in kinetic energy of the system of both vehicles. So we'll take a look at that afterwards. But anyways, uh, for A, really we're just using the formula I gave you for inelastic, um, inelastic collision. Now, in, in particular, I kind of discussed that there is a specific type of, um, of inelastic collision where they don't become one. So I, I think I mentioned that with the example of billiards where two balls hit, but they still go in the same direction, let's say. That's something, again, we're not gonna talk about, but in fact, this type of inelastic collision we're looking at technically is called perfect inelastic collision, where we kind of assume that they both become one object. In fact, I, I, I recall you know, seeing before in a game of pool where you know, a ball hits another ball, and then they're both still going forward and they hit again, so it's like a double tap. Now, for sure I've seen that, I know that can happen. But anyways, we're considering kind of simple cases. So now notice we're just gonna use this formula. Vf is equal to, if you don't remember, it's uh, m1 v1i plus m2 v2i divided by the sum of the masses, m1 plus m2. Now in this case, it's gonna be pretty simple because we have nice numbers here. Notice that, their initial velocities are actually both 15, and their masses are 18 and 900. So in this case, we actually get really, really nice numbers. And in fact, just to write it out, let me just kind of, I may erase as I go along. But if we call the first car one and the second one two, then I'll uh, just use that. So I got 1800 times 15 plus 900 times 15. And notice this one is just half of that one. And um, let me see if we can do this in our head a little bit. It's going to be kind of hard. I guess this one's kind of easier. So let's say we half this and double that, which is just kind of a quick math trick. So if we double 15, you get 30. If you half 18, you get 900. 900 times 30 is 27,000, uh, because we have three zeros now. Okay, so this is 27,000. This is half of 27,000. So in total, we get three halves of 27,000 which may be a little much to do in my head, but anyways, just something to think about. I'm actually just gonna, I think, do it like, actually maybe it is okay, because when we add these, we get 2,700. So we get 2,700, and when we add these, um, that's gonna be 15 times 900 times two times that. So you can think of 18, uh, 1,800 as 900 plus 900, so in fact, we have these kind of three 900s that are multiplied by 15. So really this is 15 times uh, 2,700. 
And I said earlier that it was uh, three halves of 27,000, and three halves is 1.5, so that's really 15 times 2,700. I'm getting a little too mathy, but that's fine. So in other words, they cancel out, and we actually get 15 meters per second, which is nice. But I, I've, uh, I've kind of made a mistake. And the mistake, of course, that I made, it's important that we realize what, what I've done here. Now, the mistake I made was that the second vehicle, remember, they're headed in opposite directions. This is assuming that they're actually headed in the same direction. And notice that, that actually can happen because if they're going at the same velocity, then there, there's no collision at all. So the formula, of course, gives us the same velocity. So since there's no collision, they're both going at the same velocity anyways. Unless they were kind of touching the whole time. But again, if they're going at the same velocity, no way they're going to collide. But there's a quick fix to this. V2i is negative 15 because it's a different direction. So with that being said, we're subtracting these. And it's still going to be kind of a nice calculation that we don't really have to use our calculator too much. But of course you can anyways. This really is just 1800 minus 900 all times 15. Of course, 1800 minus 900 is just 900. And 900 times 15, we kind of calculated um, earlier. So we said that 1800 times 15 was 27,000. So this is half of that. Half of 27 is 13.5. So it's 13.5 thousand. But I think uh, it's best really to leave it like this. Uh, and I'll explain why. Because remember, this is just 2700, and we can actually cancel quite a bit. Uh, notice the double zeros cancel. 9 goes into 27 three times, but then 3 goes into 15 five times. So in total, we get a final velocity of 5 meters per second. So it's nice that we can see some simple math coming back to us so we can handle this without our calculator. But again, if you want to use your calculator, that's on you, that's fine. Now, let's talk a little bit about the, um, the direction here. Notice it's a positive answer we get, which makes sense because notice that if we treat the uh, truck as a positive velocity and the compact vehicle as a negative velocity, which we have done here, well, since the mass of the truck is larger than the mass of the compact and they're going at the same speed, then after collision, the truck is going to take over. Just because it has a larger mass doesn't mean that's the case, though. If, uh, for instance, a compact is going faster, there is a scenario where it can actually overtake and they'll go in the direction of the compact vehicle. But since it's double the, the mass, it'll probably have to go double the speed of the other one. But something to think about um, on your own if you like. Now, here we want to figure out the change in velocity of each vehicle. Now, we know each of their finals and we know each of their initials. So for, let's say, the, the truck. So really this is, we're calling that the first vehicle. So this is the change in V1. Is V1 F minus V1 I. And notice all that is really is just, well, 5 minus 15. Which is a negative 10 meters per second. Uh, let me think about that for a moment. Yeah, I guess that's okay. So that, that makes sense because basically this is saying that the truck speed is decreasing. And it is because it decreased from what? It decreased from 15 uh, meters per second to now 5 meters per second. So that's a total change of 10 meters per second. Something a little funny happens with the compact though. So for the compact vehicle, uh, remember we labeled the compact vehicle as the second object. So this is going to be delta V2, which is V2F minus V2I. And the difference here is that, well, the, the initial, of course, is 15, but, 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 the initial velocity of the compact vehicle is negative 15, remember. So technically, this is 5 minus negative 15. Mm. And that's a double negative, so that ends up being 20 meters per second now for the compact vehicle. Now, why is that the case? It has to do with the fact that, of course, um, it was a negative velocity to begin with, so he was going 15 meters per second in this direction, but now has a change in 20 meters per second in the other direction, netting 5 meters per second in that direction, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. 
kind of embarrassing to think about it, but you know, it's just the reality of the situation. Um, just trying to think how realistic that is to have a truck that weighs double of a compact, but I guess maybe you can find those things. Uh, now for C, um, we want to find the changing kinetic energy of the system of both vehicles. So we're going to find their, the final kinetic energy and the initial kinetic energy. Now remember kinetic energy, if you don't recall, is one half mv squared. So we have two of them, one for each vehicle. But notice for final, they're acting as one, which makes sense because we only have one, um, one vf anyways. But if they're acting as one, then their mass is kind of collected, so to speak. So I'm actually going to erase this, move this up. I'll keep the wording of the original question, though, and uh, then we'll continue from there. All right, so like I was saying, we need to consider the initial kinetic energies and then the final initial kinetic energies. Then what we can do is we can subtract those to get the final change in kinetic energy of the entire system. So this is going to be 1 half mvi for the first vehicle squared plus 1 half mv2 i squared for the second vehicle. So I should have uh, labeled m as m1 and m2 also. And notice technically here, this is the sum of kinetic energies, sum of initial kinetic energies. And same thing here, we're gonna find the sum of those. So let's see, um, this is just one half m1. So one half m1 is going to be 900. And then uh, v1 squared, that's 15 squared. Plus, this is gonna be one half of 900, which is 450 times 15 squared. So that's not too bad. Now notice, uh, again, there's a lot you can do here to kind of simplify this. And in fact, I want to show a lot of math tricks as we go along. So I'm going to actually kind of keep things nice. Um, yeah, there, there, there's a lot of nice things we can do. So I'm going to keep this as actually 1 half 900. Because notice these quantities are basically the same. The only thing really what uh, they don't have in common is that this is 1 plus 1 half. So that's just 3 halves times 900 times 15 squared, which is 225. So if you want to actually evaluate with that, what that is, it's not too bad to do that. And it's just multiplying. But I'm not going to do that because we don't need that for our, our final answer. Um, our final answer is combining this with that in subtraction. So it could actually simplify a little bit. So notice this is, again, 1 half mv squared. And the other one is going to be 1 half mv squared for the other vehicle. So this is for 1, this is for 2, and these are the uh, final kinetic energy. So this is final the first, final the second. Now their masses, again, are kind of going to be the same. So it's going to be 900 and half of 900, because half of 18 is 900. So that's kind of nice. So we get 900 times the final velocity, remember, is 5. Now what's interesting here is that notice that the second initial velocity was negative 15. So if we, you want, we can include this, but negative 15 squared is still positive 15. So the fact that their absolute values of the velocities are the same, then it doesn't change anything really here. We can treat them as being the same. But for the finals, they were legitimately the same, including sign because they became entangled. So this is going to be plus one half of 900, which is the mass of the vehicle of the compact, mass of the compact vehicle, times, that was squared, and this is times 5 squared. Perfect. So I think we're set because, now notice this is again just 3 halves times 900 of 5 squared. And then notice, finally, if we find the change in kinetic energy, which is really the sum of change in kinetic energy because it's in the system, it's of the system, I guess you can say. Um, so we're going to do final minus initial. So the final is 3 halves times 900 times 5 squared minus the initial is 3 halves times 900 times 15 squared, which is uh, 225. Uh, by the way, 5 squared is 25, so maybe I'll include that here. Okay, great. Now what you'll notice is that they both have 3 halves 900 in common. And in fact, if you want to actually compute this real quick, it's not too difficult to do that. 2 goes into 900, 450 times. 
And then if you multiply 450 by um, 3, you actually get 13, 1350. Yeah. So really these combine to 1350 each. Which we kind of saw earlier, we saw another way of doing that. 3 times 900 was 2700, divided by 2 is 1350. So now notice these will both have 1350 in common, so we can factor that out. What we have left now is just this. Neg uh, 25 minus uh, 225 is negative 200. So we get 1350 times negative 200. And in fact, maybe we should have kept the over 2 because the, those would actually cancel now. In fact, notice doubling 1350 gives us back to 2700. So this is negative 2700. But now we've got two extra zeros here. So it's going to be negative 270,000 joules. Which sounds pretty crazy, but in a, uh, in a car wreck such as this, that is the change in kinetic energy. It's usually going to be that large. We have pretty heavy moving vehicles at pretty fast speeds. And as a consequence, we have a huge change in kinetic energy. Awesome. And um, yeah, it's, why is it negative? Well, that I think is kind of, I don't know if that's gonna be easy to explain or not, but I guess it's mainly because their, their final velocity is less, a lot less than the initial velocity. So basically, kind of, again, think of this as a system, right? Um, they were both, they both had velocity and they both had a mass. But then afterwards, they both have a mass still because they're entangled now, but their velocity is a lot less than it was before. So that's basically the reason why it's negative because the, the final velocity is a lot less than their both initial velocities. Even though they're in opposite directions, remember for kinetic energy, we're scoring the velocities, so the sign doesn't really matter there. And that concludes this video on momentum, impulse, and collisions. It was uh, kind of a lot like how a lot of the other videos in physics have been. So I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching.